Uh, but anyway, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this first inaugural uh, JA 2021 uh, seminar series, uh, the first of many, uh, hopefully, this year. Uh, it's unfortunate and also fortunate that we can't be together, but yet we're here together uh, in this auspicious occasion. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping rules. Uh, in case the Zoom meeting cuts off, uh, we use the exact same details and credentials to log back on into this, but because these things to happen, we only have 40 minutes, uh, five of which have already been eaten into. And uh, if you have any questions as well, please feel free to use the chat chat box or also uh, after the presenter has come through, you can either use the raise hand function uh, in case I don't see your hands uh, raised up in the video. Uh, so today's presenter, without further ado, today's presenter is uh, Dr. Ivo Mike, uh, who's a lecturer at the Department of uh, History, Heritage and Knowledge Systems at the University of Zimbabwe. He's also a postdoctoral research fellow Ryan. at the university. Yes. If, in, um, if the reception continues, Dr. So please, if the reception continues to be this bad, you may need to ask uh, colleagues to, um, I've heard that on Zoom, you can also, you know, if you cut off the video, uh, you may videos, improve uh, on, uh, yes. on reception. I'm not sure how far through that is. Oh, yes. Uh, so also when our presenter starts, we may have to have that is if the reception is good. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, also, do feel free, yes, to put off your mics, uh, uh, to put off your videos if uh, your network is uh, breaking uh, in the process. Uh, but yes, as I was saying also, uh, Dr. McKay is a senior lecturer at uh, the Department of History, Heritage and Knowledge Systems at the UZ and a postdoctoral fellow at uh, the University of the Free State in South Africa. His uh, research interests include childhood, youth culture and politics in Africa. Uh, he's currently working on a monograph which uh, holds the title Childhood, Youth and Whiteness in Colonial Zimbabwe. And uh, today's topic, uh, which he's coming to present uh, to us about, is one that will fascinate and interest many for different reasons concerning gender, liquor, and especially the issues of morality. Uh, and so we'll offer Mr. Mike 15, 10 to 15 minutes uh, to give us uh, a summary and uh, begin the conversation for us. And then thereafter, we'll take some different questions and discussions. So, Dr. Mike. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, like yeah, the, the, the convener has said, uh, Lika, gender and morality in, in white Rhodesia, you know, around 1895 to 1915, 1917, thereabout. So since the mid 1890s, to around the First World War, Salisbury, white society grappled with a small but socially significant group of white women whose presence interfered with gender, racial, and class configurations of early colonial society. Subject to pervasive social labels as in embrace, drunk prostitutes, or feral women, and living on the fringes of the emergent colonial capitalist economy through illicit liquor sales and you know, sometimes selling of sex itself. These women harnessed race and gender, race, gender, and class to maintain an asymmetrical symbolic power in a colonial town. Proprietors and masters of the liquor underworld, these women were not amenable to conventions of social etiquette and gender dictates that governed you know, white society. So this paper you know, tries to consider the history of gender, liquor, and, consumption, and liquor consumption and morality early 20th century Rhodesia. It argues that interpretations about alcohol consumption provided a convergence of ideas of race, gender, and class. The moralization of liquor, among other things, you know, uh, was one facet, you know, in a myriad, you know, sanctions designed to circumscribe social spaces open for women and establish normative behaviors to suit a certain settler culture. So at the turn of the 20th century, colonial legal laws, the presence of white men and, and state affirmation of racial boundaries for colonial control gave legal consumption new social and political meanings. 
So and I'm departing from, from Anne Stoller who agrees that the arrival of white women in colonial territories was followed by the political stabilization, which was often expressed in sundry, you know, social legal ways in the in the protection of so-called vulnerable, quote unquote vulnerable white women. And this presence of white men also brought with it um, a middle class, you know, culture or middle class values that were subsequently adopted as part of, you know, white colonial culture, you know, generally, you know. So in Rhodesia, the Black Perius K, you know, in the early 20th century was a broader expression of this resetting of, you know, racial boundaries that, you know, the coming of white women, you know, brought with images of, an, of our colleague women or a drunk prostitute exacerbated these insecurities. And these women were incongruous, you know, to the setting and their symbolic value as purveyors of middle-class values, paragons of Victorian morality and mothers of empire. A chauvinistic and patriarchal colonial uh, you know, uh, society was perturbed by alleged lurid public displays of these feral women, and some of whom were involved in illicit liquor sales. But despite the, the, these women's peripheral demographic and social position, their unseemly behaviors imperiled white prestige and undermined the gendered projection and performance of colonial white power. Marking the limits of patriarchal control over you know, women who were outside of the domestic space or marriage, you know, as, as Dr. Kufa would want to, you know, to put it. Society framed these women as a canker on colonial moral fabric, a political liability to a young colony trying to consolidate racial and social boundaries. So while alcoholism reflected an individual's lack of temperance and personal discipline, such conduct in white women had overarching you know, implications you know, on colonial white society, largely because of their gender and, 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 and race. So white women have been written into colonial histories and the emphasis on their social marginality, particularly in Rhodesia, consigns them to the fringes of urban growth of early colonial society. This paper argues that rather than being appendages of men confined in the domestic space, women strove for both economic and social independence with the varying degrees of success. Although white women became visible in the formal job market around the First World War, they had been part of the urban and colonial process for more than a decade. This paper argues that unlike their African counterparts, you know, who became part of the urbanization discourse much later, white women in Salisbury, although demographically insignificant for the most part, were able to influence the spatial utilization of Salisbury town more than their numbers would suggest. So the issue of, 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 of liquor in, in Salisbury generally, you realize that um, British colonial authorities were generally anxious about inebriate white women across, you know, the British Empire or you know, the presence of intoxicated, you know, uh, you know, male subjects around, you know, white women, you know, because this signified you know, unwanted fraternal relations and uh, of course increased the chances of sexual contact in the process. For example, right, you know, details, you know, these conflicts within, within, within the bars of Rangoon in India, you know, in the, in the 20th century. And, um, if you go to South Africa, Islo, you know, you know, uh, <clears throat> talks about uh, whites who were deported from South Africa because they were, you know, uh, fraternizing across, you know, color lines, uh, largely because they were also they were selling, you know, alcohol to Africans, and they ended up, you know, in getting involved in sexual activities as well. So ex excessive beer drinking existed in Rhodesia, you know. From much from the beginning of the 1890s, if you read Ethel Taos Jolie, it tells you about you know, the difficulties of the early years, you know, the African uprisings, then of course within the region, the Anglo Boer War. So there were a lot of social pressures and, and the, you know, the bad performance of the Rhodesian economy. So a lot of people were going off the rails and they were taking solace in, in, in liquor consumption. So we, when it came to, to, to these women, so 
drunkenness and deprivation, you know, compromise the image of the colonial white woman as the goddess of you know, white civilization, the symbol of morality and chastity, beauty, et cetera, et cetera. So for example, there was this, you know, lady, Margaret Hades, a Rhodesian settler of Belgian nationality, who was described as a quote unquote, quote unquote a habitual drunkard who during her periods, her periodic bouts of drunkenness associated with natives. On one occasion, this woman was helplessly drunk and absolutely naked in a room while a male servant was performing his duties. She became so depraved in January of 1913 that she was admitted at a rescue home in the Union of South Africa. So this, these women are appearing at a time when the, the, the colony is grappling with the white, you know, the black, black, black peril, you know, problem. So, the, you know, authorities are saying because of their drunken or bohemian lifestyles, they're exposing themselves more and more to the animalistic, you know, sexual instincts of, of the black man. So, White women's excessive liquor consumption undermine the abstract idea of you know that refined colonial white woman, you know, imbued with with you know uh, uh, imbued with 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 middle class you know values. So these women tried as much as they could to manipulate their race and gender, because the public space around this time that we are discussing was was so was so tight and gave little opportunity to to women including white women so the public space offered you know women limited economic opportunities and encouraged the contraband trade through clandestine networks white women you know constituted a significant percentage of convictions for illicit liquor sales to africans during the first two decades of the 20th century you know these are two major cities of salisbury and bulawayo recorded a considerable number of cases involving illicit liquor sales to African and white women amongst the culprits. Before the advent of the, you know, of the African operated chabins in the colonial urban areas, you know, you realize that, you know, uh, the white woman was already, you know, a chabin queen in her own right, you know. This was largely because they found themselves on the fringes of, you know, this developing colonial capitalist economy because the formal sector was, you know, was not forthcoming, did not provide much for, for, for women until the, the, the First World War. So they imagined clandestine social networks which coalesced around liquor and sex trade brought together the tag rag of white society and the socially aspirant African. Although Brussels sprout, you know, sprouted in response to the fairly large contingent of white bachelors, economic necessity drove white, you know, uh, they were called prostitutes, you know, uh, to expand their clientele base and increase their income by providing services to Africans well, as well, including, you know, liquor sales. Because of this social, social proximity, colonial officials believed that there was a direct connection between white prostitution and illicit liquor dealing, you know, targeting Africans. Police, recorded, uh, police records indicated that the majority of white prostitutes had at some point either been convicted or investigated, you know, for liquor selling to Africans or provided, you know, both. Over a period of 15 years, you know, 1899 to around 1914, there were 196 prosecutions for selling, selling illegal liquor to Africans in Bulawayo, of which 34 cases or 21% of the total involved white women. In the same period, Salisbury, the colonial capital, had 87 prosecutions and 13.7% involved you know, women. The percentage of, of offenders may look small, but considering that in 1907, Salisbury had between 20 and 30. Hello? Hello. No, you can continue. You can continue. Oh, okay. So, considering that Salisbury had about you know between thirty and you know twenty and thirty you know women involved in such operations, the picture you know uh, you know changes completely because they were a very small number, yet you know uh, they were part of a huge chunk of the market. 
So ragged hearing in a racialized and certified colonial society of Rhodesia had its reward. Some of these women were itinerant gold mines who moved about and sold fairly large quantities of dope in lucrative clandestine you know, networks. The Brindle report described the case where the courts provided that a white woman had been supplied, supplied in one month no less than 12 dozen bottles of dope. Although it could not be immediately determined how much a bottle sold for, the quantities mentioned in the report clearly suggest uh, that there was a lucrative market uh, that was provided by, you know, by Africans. However, the interesting case of Sarah Davis, a Cape colored Dutch woman, is more revealing in that, in that regard between 1899 and 1950. Sarah had eight convictions for selling liquor to Africans. In the fi first five convictions, she was given the option yeah. to either pay a fine or serve a jail term of three months. With of the colonial economy and the colonial society because you know they they end themselves all manner of derogatory names and, and stuff like that but in spite of that uh, these queens of the colonial underworld owned the properties you know that that's defying the tag rag you know a uh, label attached to their lifestyle and economic conditions in 1909 a Salisbury town council report estimated that the number of brothels in Pioneer Street had gradually increased. There were about nine containing between 20 and 30 females. Eight of these uh, you know, houses were owned by these women and uh, their value was up to 3,600 pounds at the time. You know? So, and again, They'd taken over Pioneer Street, you know, in a in a big way, where you know they controlled, you know, the business that was going there in terms of you know liquor sales and 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 and, and the business of sex to the extent that they they defiled, you know, Pioneer Street, you know, which was named, you know, in recognition of the paladins of the colony itself, you know. So much as there were very few women between twenty and thirty over this, this period, you realize that they had, a, they had an influence around the special control and influence of the city that went, that went beyond their numbers. You know, so generally, the symbolic significance of women controlling Pioneer Street and um, a desecration of the memory of the Paladins of the colony and Victorian values, you know, was in stark contrast to, you know, their numbers in, in a very big way. So you realize that Salisbury white society was failing to contain and classify this group of women because they were outside the normative uh, 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 domestic space, you know, and these, these women were able to carve a niche for themselves socially and economically, you know, taking advantage of their white skin when they were, you know, luring, you know, uh, the aspirin, the African, so to speak, and ended up, you know, you know, selling both, you know, liquor and 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 sex. But I, I, I have other evidence of, you know, their conduct on the streets, like fighting on the streets, you know, shouting obscenities, and because of their, you know, drunken, uh, you know, attitudes and 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 lifestyle, which which was quite a problem for for white society and their projection of power. And in one incident, you know, the a, 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 a minister of religion was complaining that two of these, you know, prostitutes were actually fighting, and they had to be restrained by a native, you know. So the, the projection of power was, was compromised because of the conduct and behavior of these of these uh, white women on Pioneer Street in, in South. So roughly, that's those are the ideas that I have, you know. Uh, so over to you, Convin. All right, thank you very, very much uh, for that uh, presentation. And uh, once again, apologies for the brief interruption that we went through earlier. Uh, so right now we open the floor to any questions, contributions, uh, all directed at Mr. Mike, as uh, Dr. Mike, as earlier noted, you can use the raise hand function or you can uh, type your questions in the chat box. Uh, 
Tinashe Magaya, and then Chambwe. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks so much, uh, uh, Miki, for this uh, for this paper. It's very very interesting. Um, I was wondering if you could speak more about um, women and then the liquor sales. Um, because I'm I'm thinking of is it is it really a new culture there that we are having women selling liquor? Uh, so I'm thinking about the connection between the the, the where they are coming from, the home. Um, what was the culture there? Who was selling liquor? Who was running the brothels, right? And also the idea of liquor consumption. I was also wondering if it's possible to look at where these women are coming from, right? What was the liquor consumption culture in those areas that they are coming from? Um, and also, when we establish that, can we say the consumption culture in Rhodesia was something new? Or we can actually end up saying um, <clears throat> women are seeing the colonial space um, as, a, as a space that is freeing them. Um, if we are to, to take the, the, the British, freeing them from the Victorian, uh, Victorian norms and cultures. Um, so I guess, how are women interacting with the colonial space vis-a-vis -vis the space from their home? Um, and also I'm thinking about the cultures uh, of these white women. Um, was, was it uniform, especially from the places they were coming from? Um, we, uh, white women of British stock, white women of Italian stock. Um, is their liquor or alcohol consumption culture uniform? And how does it play out in the, in the colonial space? Oh, okay, before you respond to those, uh, can we take uh, from Chambwe, then you respond, then we'll take the second round of questions after. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Mike, for that uh, very interesting paper. Uh, I was wondering if uh, you could shed more light on uh, those individuals that or structures that uh, enabled these white women to engage in prostitution and to sell liquor. Uh, what sort of men were they, if they were men? And what sort of political institutions that kind of allowed them to get into this uh, sort of business? Yeah, that's, that, that's my question. Thank you. But, um, to start with, you know, Dr. Magaya's questions, there are so many, and I have very few answers to the many questions, you know. But what I can say is, let me address the issue of freedom or, or lack thereof. Was, was the colonial space giving these women freedoms to, to do, you know, what they would ordinarily not do maybe back home in England at the time. Or I, I think this, this is a special period in the history of, 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 of Southern Rhodesia, particularly Salisbury. And we have a group of women whom the state recognizes to be providing an essential service to so-called bachelors, right? So the greater, you know, Salisbury society in parts of Bulawayo is complaining about the conduct of these women, but the state is ambivalent. While it recognizes, quote unquote, the immorality of some of their acts, they recognize that these women are essential. You know, we have a whole host of bachelors here who don't have, you know, um, anywhere else to go other than to these brothels. You know. So the state is hesitant. They don't want to clamp down on the activities of these women. But these women now are taking advantage of this ambivalent state attitude to expand their business by providing 
sexual services to Africans and, you know, uh, using their race to acquire liquor and then, you know, end up selling it to, to, to these, uh, to, 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 to Africans and, and other whites, of course, you know, so it was a lucrative business. But as to whether or not uh, colonial setting was, 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 was empowering in terms of freedoms, I wouldn't want to think that, especially if you look at the works of, of, of you know, Anne Stoller, you realize that the coming of the women actually uh, made the, the racial boundaries more entrenched to say, you know, the physical, uh, the physical separation of races. You don't come close, you don't come to our women and stuff like that. And they to abide by certain normative, you know, behaviors, which would project white superiority, white sobriety, white power, you know, the chastity of the colonial white woman is the goddess of civilization and stuff. So I don't think it was empowering in that regard. But this society in Salisbury was particularly unique because of this, you know, the, the, the sex ratios involved and the ambivalence of the state not to want to really clamp down on them. But at the same time, they overstretched that freedom by you know, then crossing you know, uh, the, racial, the racial boundaries. Um, the structure of society, I, I think I, I touched a bit on what, what Chambwe asked ever. Such of, I think it, it was largely because of the sex ratios involved around this time that you know the state was saying, no, these people are important. But these people again took advantage of that to realize that no, no, we have access to liquor, which liquor is which is, is prohibited amongst Africans. And I'm sure you know the liquor was being sold at exorbitant prices to the aspirant African because it was contraband trade, you know done within the dark corridors of, 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 of Pioneer Street. I hope I've partly answered you know, the both questions. Oh, okay, uh, if there are no follow-up questions to that, uh, we shall take a question from Nyachega. And uh, feel free to also type in some of your questions in the chat box if uh, you are too shy to open your mic. Thank you, Brian. Um, Dr. Mika, thank you for your very interesting, uh, you know, talk. Um, and um, I was wondering um, if you can categorize or you can conceptualize um, the everyday, you know, race relations, uh, you know, across color lines, as you say, as, um, you know, a way to think about, uh, the inconsistencies or the vulnerability of, of the empire or the colonial state. I think you have touched a bit on that, but I think it would be interesting to look at those dynamics where, uh, as you also said, when the colonial state, the Rhodesian state knew that, you know, the presence of white women was part of, you know, the essential services, um, they could not prosecute or they could not be too tough on those white women. So I think that's an interesting uh, way to think about the inconsistencies of the, the empire, right? Um, and how different women uh, exploited those opportunities. And I think uh, there's a book that I you know, once read uh, called Crossing the Color Line. It's set in, in colonial Ghana, but it's also about black women exploiting the colonial state's policies where when they knew that the colonial state didn't want white uh, white men to to have sexual relations with white uh, black women, they would challenge them even in courts, knowing that they wouldn't want to prosecute white men. And, and in the end, some white men would end up marrying um, black women. So if you could think broadly about some of those aspects. And my last co comment or question, um, would be to think about the question of language. I don't know if that's something you're thinking about in your work, um, but via the colonial archive or the records that you're looking at, for example, do we see these women being framed as prostitutes? 
or vagrants or any other forms of you know names assigned to those women and if that is the case why do we see that so i will stop there for now okay uh, thank you very much uh, nick i would i would take the first one as a as a suggestion because it, it needs to be yeah thank you very much <clears throat> right yeah indeed that that's that's why i i i, I doubt even uh, there were prostitutes on Pioneer Street, but any any unbecoming behavior, you know, being seen in a drunken stupor, you were highly likely going to be labeled a prostitute because of that, you know, or unbecoming behavior or conduct of being, say, fighting on the streets, you were highly likely, you know, so the 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 establishment, so to speak, was trying to protect itself, you know by labeling people say i know that behavior is consistent with prostitutes you know to try and protect you know the vulnerable uh, uh, edifice of white superiority and stuff like that so they will quickly push doubt and label as prostitutes to explain you know unbecoming behavior so indeed because if you read uh, uh dr kufa's work on prostitution you realize that there were indeed prostitutes on, on Pioneer Street who provided an essential service, but there were certain behaviors that were labeled, you know, prostitute behavior in their own, you know, you know, in, 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 in. everything that was not consistent with the normative behaviors was highly likely to be labeled. And if you were a woman, you know, you would just be called a prostitute. It was easy. I saw that when I was dealing with my, my, my juvenile, you know, delinquents, you know, any unbecoming behavior would be called delinquent, you know, automatically. Or there's a problem with mental retardation in the child so that the whole establishment of white superiority is protected. That one is mentally retarded. That's why they are behaving in such fashion because the rest of, you know, uh, the race is actually superior, you know, uh, in terms of culture, in terms of mental capacity and other things. So uh, it's a very important observation that you make the element of language in how these people are described. So any kind of unbecoming behavior, you will highly likely to be labeled. Uh, thank you, well, On your last statement, uh, can I just throw in a question? Was uh, that a label of prostitute across gender lines that was specifically targeted in one direction and in one specific group? Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't see anywhere where we had male prostitutes. You mean our, our gigglers now? I don't know if they existed at the time, you know, or if they were called, you know, prostitutes, but these were female prostitutes. So clients were exempt from that sort of social stigma and run away, but that type of social labeling. <clears throat> Salisbury was was full of quote and unquote bachelors. <clears throat> right? Quote unquote, full of bachelors. Very few men were married around the 1900s, and but is, you know, the number of women increased over, over the time. You realize that more and more marriages, you know, began to appear. So the Pioneer Street area becomes a, a hive of Bohemian culture. If you read Richard Parry, he, he talks about, you know, a growing culture of prostitution, gambling, and 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 and, and uh, you know liquor drinking, and, and you know all sorts of of, 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 of Bohemian you know uh, social lifestyles. So you realize that the, there were people who belonged to that society. Maybe we had very little object obligation to please society. You know, if you want your services, you just go there. And, and 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 satisfy yourself you know that's 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 what i what i read from my archive uh okay all right uh 
we'll take a question from uh, Kudakwasha and then we ask Mr. Mike to listen there and also read the message uh, from uh, Chamisa in the chat box as well. Where is the chat box? Kuda? Um, thank you very much, uh, Ivo, for a very... Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ivo, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, in your talk about, um, I'm, I'm much more interested in the much, much earlier period of, of your discussion here, um, the early 1900s, uh, 1908, 19, up to the 1914s, 1915, there above, where we find a move towards the creation, uh, you know, segregation of, 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 of urban space um, mm -hmm. with the creation of uh, Arari Township in 1906, 1908, there about. Um, you find that in the in the local debate that that instigated the creation of this of this location were also issues to do with uh, at that time what they called the safety of the um, of the whites, um, which was the, a concern that was coming in from the number of Africans who were staying in the Kopi area. And as such, we're also fraternizing that area and many other drinking spots um, found in, in Salisbury at the time. And the interactions um, thereabouts with, uh, with, uh, with uh, white prostitutes. Uh, in your, in your, I'm much more interested, I think it's, it, was, it, was, it was Nick who raised the issue of language. But for me, I want to come in through the issue, how, how is, this issue presented in the archives that you are using. Because there's an issue of prostitution, there's an issue of interaction between Africans and whites. But I was much more interested in thinking much more about safety rather than uh, um, white prostitutes offering their services to Africans. What kind of language is that do, do people who deal with prostitutes per se during that time use to engage that problem at that time. Yeah, I, I, I get your point, but I am yet to visit a lot of, you know, some of these files. You know, I was hoping to go into court case files, you know, that prosecuted illicit liquor sales and stuff like that. So, Wushe touches a bit on, on, on that, you know, but I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to be, be able to answer you directly. When he's talking about even how that copy area is so, it becomes so defiled in the eyes of the general public that they were even averse to passing through Pioneer Street on their way to Salisbury Cemetery because that was the only way out of town into Salisbury Cemetery. They were actually saying, you know, they are, they are desecrating that procession. You know, the Pioneer Institute was desecrating the procession to, to the cemetery because of the goings on, you know, along that street, you know. But with regards to the specifics that you've asked about, I'm here to come across a specific, you know, kind of you know, language that was being used. But it had become so much of a problem that there were representations, you know, from the general public to the government to say, do something about Pioneer Street. But the government was ambivalent, was unwilling to, to come down heavy on the goings on along Pioneer Street because of you know, the safety net, the comforts of home, if you want, uh, that, it, that you know, these women provided. Thank you, Okay, uh, Tinashe, I saw your raise, your hand is raised, and uh, uh, is there anyone else uh, with a burning question? I see that we are left with about five minutes left, so we would give the floor to Tinashe and to Nick, and try and keep it short so anyone with a burning question can come through, and they can also be in the conversation. So uh, this is short. Um... I'm just going to piggyback on uh, Nyachega Stofiri on the issue of, of language there. Um, I think 
um, it also ties into what I what, what I was also asking in the like when I made the first round of in the first round of questions. Um, I think I'm just going to be naughty here. Were they prostitutes mm. or were they were commercial sex workers? Why am I asking this? Because um, like what Nyachega said about language and also what Stofi said, um, uh, do we, are we not running the risk of writing the history of women using the language that the men create? This is why I was asking about that freedom in Salisbury. Do these women see themselves as prostitutes or commercial sex workers? Um, it's just something to, to think about. Then, um, the other thing is just a comment. Yesterday I was talking, um, we we're just discussing the title of your, of your paper with somebody, American, of course, a woman. Mm -hmm. And she was saying in the deep South, the belief, the belief was, or she was saying my father still believed women should not drink liquor. Um, by liquor, she meant women should not drink any spirited um, drink, uh, alcohol, all right? They should drink beer. So I was thinking, is, was this the same culture when people were talking about liquor? Did they see liquor as the fermented spirit or it's something different? Oh, okay. All right. uh, I think... All, all the all that you've touched on, you know, you know, revolves around language. You know, <laughs> even even liquor itself. Maybe it included beer as well. You know, <laughs> because it was the clear beer that was not supposed to be sold again to to Africa, right? So maybe it was liquor was you know clear intoxicating beverages. You know, I will have to go deeper into into my files to to really un un unpack the element of language, particularly. Who is a prostitute? Who, who is calling them prostitutes? And is it really liquor, liquor as a spirit, or it involved clear beer, you know, with a normal percentage alcohol, but it was just put under, you know, that because it was prohibited. So I will have to really get into that. I think mine was also, you know, a kind of a follow up on the question of language. And I think really, you know, there is, there is a good, you know, uh, discussion uh, you've you know, offered in terms of thinking about language. Uh, so the existing record that you might have would be the colonial state uh, uh, archive uh, that, describe, that describes, you know, these encounters. But I'm also wondering if there are any kind of novels um, that exist for that period. Why? Because I'm thinking about this idea of an everyday kind of language. Uh, if you, for example, if you go to Mbari today uh, or to Wonde Valley at a bar, people explain their experiences very differently in their very everyday ways of, you know, uh, languages. For example, if they are talking about a specific liquor, they have a specific name if they're talking about women who show up at the bars they have different names they are assigned to those women so thinking back to the colonial period what would be a woman like um in Salisbury call themselves when they go to the drinking spots or where they engage in in these kind of uh, relationships across color lines for example so yeah uh, that's what I just wanted to put across. If you could think about novels as a possibility to. Oh, okay. right. Thank you very much. I, I hope, uh, yeah. yeah, things like like novels. Yeah, reading, you know, pioneer literature like Thomas Morgan Thomas and, and stuff like that. You realize that the issue of drink was quite, you know, central in how, you know, colonial culture developed. You know, commodity broking and stuff like that. So yeah, I'll, I'll look into, into pioneer literature, particularly the urbanized kind of lifestyles to understand some of these things. Thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you, Dr. Mike, for your fascinating presentation. Thank you everyone for also attending. Uh, please do attend the other seminars that uh, we would have lined up for you. Uh, continue to remain safe, sanitize and wear your masks and be safe. Look after yourselves.
and keep writing and writing. Drink and writing. less liquor. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks man. Drink liquor, kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> drink liquor, and have primary sources. Yeah, yeah.